Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for listening. This week, an interesting conversation with President Jefferson, a very pleasant one about books and education and water. We also took time to properly welcome Clay Jenkinson back from his Montana Lewis and Clark adventures. And welcome back, sir. Physically exhausted, spiritually refreshed. I met wonderful, wonderful people out on the Lewis and Clark Trail. It's amazing that I get to do this. These excursions, they're filled with adventure. There's lots of talk. In fact, on the Lewis and Clark trip, there was more discourse about Lewis and Clark than in any previous uh, Lewis and Clark journey. I've done it for more than 20 years. But because of the fires, we were confined to a lower campsite a couple of times, and so there was extended period of conversation and chances for, for me to provide short lectures, but endless discussion about that, about the West, about uh, climate change, about Thomas Jefferson, of course, about the future of, of the wilderness. I couldn't have asked for better people on both journeys. One was on the Salmon River, which was a float trip on a Class Three and Class Four river down dramatically, but still thrilling, and I'm happy to report that when I was alone in the kayak, or actually in the kayak with a wonderful Nebraskan by the name of Ben, I went under and had to be fished out of the Salmon River, um, half drowned, but uh, but still happy. Huh. The Lewis and Clark trip was just, uh, was just spectacular, so we're doing a couple of them again next year. I think the dates are 17 through 26 July and 31 July to August 9th, and so people can start to sign up for those immediately, and I hope that they get in early because we're now building waiting lists for this most famous of all the trips, and it was spectacular. Getting on the canoe east of Fort Benton, Montana, and drifting southeast for about 45 miles in the most beautiful single section of the entire Missouri River, a river of 3,000 miles. And on the second journey, before we got to the Salmon, we went to the source of the Missouri River. You know, Lewis talks about it on August 12th, 1805, and says at the distance of four miles farther, we came to the, the fountain of the Missouri River in search of which we have spent so many toilsome days and restless nights. And he said, two miles below, McNeil stood with one foot on either side of this little rivulet and thanked his God that he had lived bestride the mighty and heretofore deemed endless Missouri River. We went there at the base of Lemhi Pass. Everyone got to bestride the great Missouri River. It was just spectacular. That's great. It sounds like there's uh, new adventures every year. It's not, it, it, you learn new things and discover new things. I want to get to the show, but before we do, there was a letter that I had hoped to include in the show, but we ran out of time. It comes from Stephen Littlejohn. He says, I'm writing to congratulate you on your new book, The Language of Cottonwoods, Essays on the Future of North Dakota. My wife and I enjoyed the book immensely. We came to appreciate the state because of your insights and engaging prose. And he also says it was very meaningful because his wife's family came from North Dakota, having immigrated originally from Norway. And you might enjoy knowing that the Homestead Act stamp was modeled on a photograph of the family's original sod house. He says his wife has recommended the book to all of her cousins. A couple of people have written in about buying it and getting you to sign it. Is that difficult for them to do? No, they just go to jeffersonhour.com, uh, send a note, then um, Beth Kaler, my able assistant and handler, will arrange for this. The money is the least of it. We're not concerned about that. Of course, people will pay, but we're, we're not sticklers about that. And if they tell me what they want me to say in the signing, I will sign it and we'll ship it off to them. And, and, and I love this. Uh, and to Stephen Littlejohn, just, I hope you have lots of cousins. Thanks for reading the book. I'm so proud of it. I'm getting some wonderful feedback from people from all over the place, not just North Dakotans. I'm getting it from average North Dakotans and prominent North Dakotans. And so far, there have been no vicious attacks, although stay tuned, because I suggest some things we need to think about as we move towards the future of North Dakota life. But I'm, I'm really thrilled with this book, and I'm so gratified that all the feedback that I'm getting has been so utterly positive. And several people have said to me, David, you know, you, you, you nailed it. You got it. You, you, you got to the heart of the North Dakota identity and character. And, and nothing could please me more than hearing those words come out of somebody's mouth. There will be more book signings. It's not really about North Dakota, although it is. It's about the Great Plains. It's about rural America. It's about... 
how we entertain ourselves. It's about what is a life of spirit of place? How, how are we related to the landscapes which we're born on and which shape us? And so I make a distinction between accidental North Dakotans and naturalized North Dakotans. And that, that idea has struck a spark in a number of people. So people can get the book by ordering it online from Barnes & Noble or Amazon.com or your, your local bookstore will order it for you. It may not yet be in your local bookstore, but it's certainly possible to ha have them get it for you. But also they can just go to the Jefferson Hour site, make their wishes known, and then Beth will facilitate it and make sure we get them to you in a timely way. And so my, my dream, is, as I've said before, I think is that this book would become a kind of North Dakota Reads book, one of those books that... Uh, a state or a community decides to read together and to generate discussion because it's a summing up of what I've been thinking about the Great Plains for, for decades, but it also is, a, I hope, an invitation to a conversation about the future, in particular, the future of the agrarian ideal. To all of those who are listening who are on the Lewis and Clark trips, you know who you are. Thank you. What a wonderful, wonderful summer it's been. Time now to get down to work. I'm working on my Edward S. Curtis exhibit for the Theodore Roosevelt Symposium in Dickinson, North Dakota at the end of September. Uh, I'm starting in on a couple of new books, tons of books to read, David, and glad to be back in the saddle. And uh, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone who came on these trips. They all send their greetings to the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. Very good. Thank you, sir. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar, author, and creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me now is President Thomas Jefferson. Good to see you, sir. Good day to you, sir. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, sir. I... I suspect your gardens are in decline, or, or are you still busy with them? Oh, we'll still be busy until October. We grow as many things that are seasonal as we possibly can. So we begin in late January or early February with things like lettuce and planting potatoes and other root crops that are impervious to frost. And then we grow lettuce week by week by week until it can't grow anymore because of the great heat in Albemarle County. But we have not yet harvested our corn, squashes, tomatoes. I mean, many things ripen about this time of year at the end of the summer, but some things continue to grow well into the fall. You know, we, we have so few frosts at Monticello. That gives us a very long growing season compared to anything in New England, for example. Well, often, sir, you've given me a hard time in good humor about where I live and I have to tell you, sir, in, in my part of the country, it's it's pretty bleak this year. I believe we went 26 days without any measurable precipitation, temperatures in the 90s even exceeding 100-some days. The poor farmers in Dakota are cutting their corn early to uh, use it as cattle feed because it would not mature. That's a disaster for your farmers. The thing we all must do more than anything else is to eat. In my time, about 95 to 97 percent of us were farmers, and so we were self-sufficient in a way that your era cannot know. And I understand you have a Hamiltonian farm program in your time, which greatly complicates the business of growing food, but provides a certain sort of a federal safety net under your farmers. I, I'm against that, of course, because the whole point of being a farmer is to be independent of government. The farmer grows his own food. He provides his own shelter. In many cases, he, he weaves his own cloth for his clothing. He's independent. He's self-sufficient. He doesn't require stores, shops, or government to continue. And if the government collapsed, he would just continue to grow his rutabagas. But once you create a Hamiltonian farm program, now the farmer has to look to a faraway government in Washington to secure him. And that means government has far too much power, and we all know that when government can provide subsidies, it can also take them away, depending on the political mood and the capacity of the budget to sustain such things. And so the very idea of the agrarian dream of America is to make us independent of government. When government starts to tell us how to grow our potatoes, we will be as hungry 
as we are ill when doctors try to teach us what it is to be healthy. This this is greatly troubling to me. But but you have transportation systems and a, and an infrastructure that can move food uh, long distances across oceans. I'm told for thousands of miles, a tomato might make its way to your Great Plains, and from thousands of miles, a raspberry might appear on your table. That certainly wasn't true in my time. All food was local. When we transported, say, rice, it was a very difficult thing to do. The ships, if you can call them that, were the size of yachts. They often miscarried at sea. It was hard to keep things from getting damp. Grains are heavy. They're relatively low financial value crops, and so you can't really afford to send grains a long distance. Tobacco is a high value crop, and so we could afford to send it in bottoms, uh, ships, over to England or France. But wheat and oats and rye and flax and indigo and cotton, for that matter, were quite difficult to ship. The cash flow simply didn't benefit the farmer too much. And we didn't have an international system of currency exchange. All food was local in my time. And if you had a drought, you were going to be really pressed to feed yourself. You might be able to buy a few things from neighbors, but they might be suffering from those conditions too. It could be drought, it could be flood, it could be um, the Hessian uh, fly that was damaging our wheat crops or rust or any other of the other maladies that can come to grains. And so we lived more precariously than you do. And nobody ever went hungry at Monticello, so far as I know. We had rations for the slaves. Um, We made sure that they were always adequately fed. I I don't recall a time when we were desperate to get food for ourselves or for our slaves at Monticello. But there were lean times when it wasn't certain how we would continue to have food if bad conditions continued. A very cool year, a very hot year, a year too rainy, or a year with drought. And one reason I had such a gigantic garden was because I never wanted to be in the position of of having a scarcity of food for myself and my immediate family and the larger family of my enslaved men and women. I have a, a number of interesting questions from listeners this week. This one comes from Thurman Bridges, And he says, please tell me about the water management system at Monticello. What was your water source and what system did you use to access water? Also, what was water consumption like? How often did people bathe? At Monticello, we were on a mountain, 867 feet in height. I had had it leveled before we built Monticello. All of the materials, with very few exceptions, came from the mountain or from the the valleys below. The great problem at Monticello was water supply. This gentleman is is absolutely right. We had wells, but at that height, you're not going to have wells that run reliably. So we tried to collect water in other ways. And I had a system of cisterns in which the rains that came to the roof would be channelized through pipes down into cisterns. It rains about 45 inches per year at Monticello, so there's plenty of moisture if you only know how to capture it. The problem with this system is that the cisterns leaked. We did not have the materials that you have to store water. In your time, you could provide a cistern that could supply Monticello or, for that matter, all of Charlottesville, more or less instantly. But in my time, I experimented with one form of cistern. After the next, they all leaked. They all had great difficulties. And so if it didn't rain for a couple of weeks at Monticello, unfortunately, I had to send slaves down the mountain to the creeks below, down even to the Ravana at times, to bring back buckets of water. And you can imagine what a horrible business that is. Water weighs a great deal. Uh, The mountain roads were steep. Uh, Gravity um, has a huge and enervating effect on all of this. I despaired at times of my capacity to get cisterns or any system of water that would be reliable. We never went thirsty, of course, uh, but there were times when it was a real struggle. Well, it is very difficult in the Great Plains. We're in an exceptional drought in in my area. My sympathies go to the farmers and gardeners who are trying to deal with this. It's pretty difficult to carry water. Most farmers have irrigation systems. Most gardeners have the same. In my time, We did not have your good fortune in this regard. 
Sir, that question came from Thurman Bridges, and I thank him for it. Along the same lines, we got a comment, really, from David Kepper about a flower that was named for you, Jeffersonian diphila. It was named by the American Philosophical Society. It's a beautiful little purple flower. Are you aware of this, sir? There are a number of things that are named for me. Um, I don't particularly think that's a good idea. I'm unaware of, of this flower, but so many of these things happened later. Binomial classification had begun with Linnaeus, and it was uh, about 100 years old when Lewis and Clark went up the Missouri River in 1804, and they used the Linnaean binomial classification system, although they were not adept at it. But this was one of the great breakthroughs one of the great achievements of the Enlightenment. You look out at nature and you see this flower and that flower and this grain and that grain and, and this grass and that grass, and it all is sort of a continuum or even a chaos. But along comes Linnaeus and says, well, let's try to figure out a way to classify these things. And so he invented this very system. So what is their leaf structure? What is their root structure? How do they flower? What are their fruits? What do they resemble and in what ways are they unique? He developed this way of going from all the way at the top of the scale from animals and minerals and vegetables and working his way down until he could nominate a species according to its genus and its specific species identification. And although he made some mistakes, it was one of the greatest achievements of the Enlightenment and allowed us finally to begin to classify things and to, and to realize what things were related to other things. And once you know that, it not only makes it easier to grow food, but it helps you understand what parts of plants might be medicinal, what things are edible and which are poison, what things flourish only in dry conditions and which ones flourish only in humid conditions. And so this was one of the really extraordinary scientific benefits of reason, good sense, Francis Bacon's patient accumulation of data. You know, Bacon, one of my three intellectual heroes, said, sample, get samples, get data, find descriptions, get facts, avoid jumping to conclusions, gather your data over a long and painstaking period, and then and only then begin to bring order to it. But don't start from a deductive system that's medievalism, and that was a, a profound failure of the human mind. But even in induction, hold off your classifications and your conclusions until you have enough data that you're probably on the right track. And so Linnaeus is part of the Enlightenment, just as our encyclopedias and the classification of clouds and what would eventually become the periodic table of elements. There was a mania in the Enlightenment, to look at nature and say, well, that's a different sort of a cloud from the one I saw yesterday. Maybe there are different ways to define them and, and to give them names and, and to produce classes of clouds. The same is true of animals and plants and minerals and everything else in the world. And although Meriwether Lewis was not regularly educated, he knew enough about what had already been discovered that he didn't reinvent things, he didn't make errors of repetition. He didn't pretend to discover things that were already well known. But he also had just enough of Linnaean science to be able to bring preliminary classification to some of the animals and plants that he encountered on his extraordinary journey up the Missouri between 1804 and 1806. Thank you so much, Mr. Jefferson. It's time for us to take a short break from this conversation, but we will return to it. I have a number of interesting questions from your listeners, sir. I'm eager to hear more. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And Mr. Jefferson has agreed to answer listener questions this week. And, sir, we have some interesting ones. I'm going to begin with a question from Demi. She's a high school senior from Colorado, and she says it delights her to live in a place where she is continually reminded of your great land purchase. What a good way to start a question, sir. Well, I take only limited credit for the Louisiana purchase. 
her question, sir, is in regards to education. She writes, I am a lover of liberty and reason, and I have many a time unsuccessfully tried to replicate your own education with my means, buying and collecting books, trying to become a student of the Enlightenment in these modern times. But it's proved difficult for me. I don't know where to start or how I should categorize my readings. In short, I was wondering what advice you would have on this issue. In order to be a good student of liberty, should I study your own time extensively, or should I also study Greece and Rome? Should I focus on history more than political theory, or both? I apologize if this is a lengthy question, but I greatly value your insight. Well, first of all, what an extraordinary young woman, clearly on the right path. I wish her well in everything she does. Um, a couple of things that might be useful. First, liberty is written in your heart. The Creator put into us a series of propositions that we call natural law, the basic laws of fairness and justice. We all have them. We're born with a moral sense. Nobody invented liberty. Liberty is as important to the human project as an arm is or a leg. Uh, we're born with an understanding that humans are entitled to a maximum of independence and freedom. And if we enter into a, into a society, we do so voluntarily. We're not subjected to it. We overtly agree to what's called the social compact. And when we create a social compact, which is a sort of a recipe for our mutual interactions in the public square, it's in our interest to make that government as tiny and as local as possible. In other words, we should keep the maximum quantum of our liberty in ourselves and yield as little of it as is necessary for public order and for the efficiency of an economy. But to give it all to government, as in a tyranny, or to have government take it, as tyrants do, or to give it all to a Hamiltonian system which creates big government with an extensive intrusion into people's lives, that's counterproductive to the very idea of human self-reliance and liberty. My first proposition is that these things are, are not to be scoured for in books. They exist in the human heart. But if you want to use books to get at them, of course, read John Locke, his second treatise on government. Read the Federalist Papers, which is the best practical guide to government that has ever been written, at least in the United States, read Voltaire, read Bolingbroke, uh, read David Hume, although Hume, I must say, has very strong Tory sensibilities, and you must read him with a, with a pretty considerable skepticism. But the list is long of Enlightenment treatises, and Thomas Paine is perhaps the easiest way into a discussion of these things because he wrote in so lucid and, and unpretentious a style. The second thing that I would say about this is that you probably want to start learning Latin and Greek. I don't know if this is part of your curriculum, but if you're as bright as your letter suggests, you could easily learn Latin in a couple of years and Greek in five or six or seven, and this would be some of the best training you could have for whatever you wind up doing in life. If you learn Latin and Greek, it will facilitate all of the rest of your learning. It will give you deep satisfaction, and you will be able to read Virgil, the Aeneid, in Latin, or the Odes and Epodes of Horace, or the history of Tacitus or Livy in Latin, and in Greek, which is even more important, although more elusive, I will admit, you can read Thucydides and Herodotus if history is your interest. But of course, the crown of Greek literature is the Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So start in on those languages. But meanwhile, you have an advantage in your time that we didn't in mine. You have absolutely outstanding translations of these Greek and Roman classics. Unfortunately, in my time, the translations were weak. So Alexander Pope had written translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I think one of the British critics rightly said of the Iliad, it's a very pretty poem, but it's not Homer, that these translations were so vague, imprecise, poeticized, uh, rendered into metaphors and similes and figurative speech that was never used in the ancient world, that they were largely separate creations rather than true translations. But in your time, 
The translations are probably as great as they have ever been in the history of the world, and they're freely available. And the last thing I will say is that I know as a young woman, you probably don't have access to funds. The good news is that your electronic world, which I don't even begin to understand, makes available to you not only thousands of texts, but tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of texts from the ancient world or from the modern world, absolutely free. Um, I would have given anything. I would have given absolutely anything to have the access that you have to the world of ideas, the world of history, philosophy, architecture, literature, science, classics, etc. You have more access than any young woman who has ever lived on the face of the planet. And all of it is free if you only develop the skills to go get it. And so my suggestion is that you do all of that. Spend five or 10 years reading as many hours per day as you can muster. Uh, and then the work of revolution begins. Perhaps you will be able to redeem American culture. I have another question along the same lines. It comes from Ed Gibbs and he writes, Mr. Jefferson, I've been reading the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius and Seneca. Did you read any of them? And if so, did they influence your thinking? Oh, yes, indeed. I am a Stoic at heart, and I learned that from reading the ancient Stoic classics. Stoicism means something like this, that you keep an even temper no matter what comes to you, that there's an equanimity in your spirit that you cannot be easily ruffled, or derailed by misfortune, and you aren't overly excited by pleasure or happiness. In fact, that you define happiness as rational pleasure, virtuous pleasure, rather than hedonism, and you try to create a character that is steady, reliable, even, unperturbable. To do this, you can read classics in both Greek and Latin, Seneca particularly, in the Latin language, but... Yes, I read Marcus Aurelius. I read all of the Stoics. They are kind of a guide to me through life. And this is one of the things that I think people in my time didn't fully understand and people in your time don't. They saw me as uncandid, duplicitous, secretive, or different in public from what I might be behind closed doors. I think what they failed to understand is that I had worked very hard to discipline my own personality, my own character, so that I would become a stoic, that I would always be mannered and polite, that I would never be offensive to anyone in their person if possible, that I showed great decorum and a, a spirit of candor and civility in my correspondence. Yes, of course, I had strong opinions about a very large number of things, and in private I was willing sometimes to express those opinions in a way that I would not in public. But I think the goal in the world is to rub off all the roughnesses in our nature. You know, all of us are rough. Some have anger, some have jealousy, some have, are self-pitying. Uh, some people are, are uh, cynical. Others have an aggressive spirit or a problem with periodic rage or, or are so romantic that they are unreliable in day-to-day -day life. We're all born into the world as a tabula rasa, as a blank slate, and then we become whatever is the sum total of the stimuli that come to us and from our reading and our observations and our families and our teachers and so on. And everyone is rough. No one is fully civilized in nature, but in culture, in civilization, we can rub off those rough edges. And it's in our interest to do so because we have to live together. And we are not always going to agree. We're going to have to agree to disagree. And people we disagree with are not necessarily our enemies. They are just people with different points of view. And even if we think their points of view are absurd or extremely wrong-headed, that doesn't mean they're bad people. And the more we can remember that and treat other people with a sense of civility and generosity of spirit to respect them, even when we don't agree with them, and finally, to disagree as rational friends rather than bitter enemies. That's what makes life livable. That's what redeems our social engagement. If we get rid of all that and live like frontier ruffians, and indeed there were such out in Kentucky and Ohio and Tennessee, and then frankly some in Virginia too, 
if we just let our natural impulses govern us, the world would be unlivable. It's harmony that creates a social structure worth living in. The Stoics are extremely important to my training, and you could not go wrong by reading the Stoics. Again, as I said to the last questioner, in your time you have outstanding translations of the great Stoic texts, and I would be very happy to provide a list of my favorites to anyone who might wish them. Sir, this has been such a pleasant conversation this week. Gardening, books, education. Perhaps we'll return to politics in a future conversation, but I know these are subjects you enjoy discussing, and I have one more. We'll return to the garden. This one comes from Al Pascal. He mentions that he listened to a conversation that you and I had, oh, some four or five, six weeks ago about the garden. He uh, has an appreciation of gardening, which was instilled in all of us growing up from his grandparents who came from Italy. He says about 15 years ago, they took their then 10-year-old son to Monticello. And while their son was fascinated by the writing desks and document copy contraption, he calls it, my wife and I were amazed at the gardens, particularly the fig trees next to the wall behind the house. There seemed to be a number of varieties growing there. He says, while I remember hearing that Jefferson brought plants from France, where else did these come from? We had the pleasure of tasting some of the figs there, and they were delicious. And he ends saying, thanks to you, sir. Well, I should say, first of all, that I appreciate such letters. They're very endearing to me, and uh, he should consult the garden book, which I began, one of my five daily diaries, in the 1760s, and it has a very extensive list of, of the plants that I attempted to grow at Monticello, uh, their origins, um, and how well they succeeded, and, and how I disseminated them when I thought that they might grow elsewhere. My philosophy of this is simple. First of all, uh, Albemarle County is an ideal climate for most things. Not all, it's not tropical, um, and it's certainly things that grow only in deserts, like cactus, are going to have a harder time in a humid place like Monticello. But given temperate climate, there are a few places that are more likely to flourish for gardens or orchards than the hills of, of Virginia and my own estate at Monticello. In addition to that, I was just fascinated by this, that, that you know you have seeds. If you lined up a, a thousand seeds on a table... Uh, they have some difference in their look and in their size, but they're all seeds. And yet if you let them grow, one is a fig tree and another one is a peach and a third is an apple and a fourth is grapes. You know, if you plant seeds, one's a carrot and another one is an ear of corn and something else is a squash or a cucumber. Um, I mean, think of the variety, the almost miraculous variety of plants that are edible or medicinal, useful to humans in one way or another. And then think of the, the number of different things that one can grow in a garden. It's, it's astonishing to think that you can grow a tomato side by side with a cucumber and then side by side with a turnip. And that all of these are extraordinarily important to human happiness and, and to our nutritional uh, success. So that's the basis of this, and I wanted to try everything. And so when I was in France, I brought back vines and uh, cuttings from figs and olives and other things from France, as many as I thought might have a chance to be useful. Um, the more useful, the better. Some things are merely ornamental, and I love that too, of course. No sprig of grass grows uninteresting to me. But the more useful the thing, of course, uh, the more important it is to try to get it on a small ship coming back from France to Norfolk. Uh, so I brought as many things as I dared. And then people from all over the world and certainly from all over the United States would send me seeds. They would say, Mr. Jefferson, knowing how much you love these things, I'm sending you these, these seeds for tangerines or I'm sending you these seeds for um, muskmelons. And I would get them at Monticello and I would catalog them and save a few uh, just for security's sake and then try to grow them. And some things grew and, and some things didn't. Meriwether Lewis brought back seeds, sent back and then brought back seeds for me, and I grew some of them at Monticello, including Mandan corn, 
uh, and uh, a Ricara tobacco and a, and a range of other things. And so there was a sense in which the guards at Monticello weren't just to feed us, they were a kind of grand experimental laboratory where I could try to see the range of seeds from all over the world. And you know, if we can incorporate into our system something like the olive, I mean, the olive is one of the most important plants in the world because it provides oil and it provides olives. You know, here's a tree that, that, that contributes to human nutrition, not to mention happiness. And so I brought back olives and wanted to see if they would grow in South Carolina. Unfortunately, the farmers of South Carolina were not as interested in this as I am. I also brought back upland rice uh, from northern Italy uh, because I wanted to, to see if I could introduce into the Carolinas and Georgia a, a strain of rice that didn't involve the flooding of fields. And the, the rice I was able to smuggle out of Italy was superior, in my opinion, to the rice that we grew in this country. Unfortunately, again, uh, there was less interest in this in the Carolinas and Georgia than I would have hoped. I also brought merino sheep to the United States, a, a superior type of sheep that are heartier and produce a finer and, and more voluminous wool. And so in all of these ways, I tried to bring to this country things that would help us thrive, uh, survive, and succeed. Uh, some of them were whimsical, but most of them were utilitarian. Figs are one of the world's great fruits, and I wanted to grow as many varieties as I could at Monticello. I should say one thing as a historical note. After Mr. Hamilton's unfortunate sexual scandal with Maria Reynolds, uh, the woman who was part of a husband and wife blackmail team that made the worst of Mr. Hamilton, um, when he was serving as the Secretary of the Treasury, after that scandal, which essentially put an end to his presidential aspirations and nearly put an end to his, his whole political career, uh, George Washington, who still loved him and, and who felt sympathy for poor Mr. Hamilton, sent him a basket of figs from Mount Vernon. And of course, if you know anything of the mythology of figs, they are often uh, regarded as... Uh, symbolic of, of human sexual desire. And so by Washington sending a basket of figs to poor Hamilton, he was not only showing his love of Hamilton, but showing a certain irony uh, and possibly even a small level of judgment at the same time. Very good, Mr. Jefferson. It's been a pleasure to speak with you this week. You too, sir. And, and what a subject. And, and I'm still struck by this letter from this young woman of the far west who, who wants to master the, the whole world of, of the literature of liberty. Uh, give me more such Americans, sir. We must encourage her to keep in touch with us and let us know how her studies are going. Meanwhile, sir, we need to take a short break. When we return, we'll be speaking with the gentleman who portrays President Jefferson, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. We'll be back in just a moment you're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson and your weekly conversation with the gentleman who portrays President Jefferson, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And right off the top, I need to welcome you back from your travels to Montana, uh, all of our joking about whether or not you'd survive it. Well, you obviously did. You look tan, rested, and uh, ready to go. Are you, are you settled in? I'm settling in. The to-do lists that awaited me when I got back were pretty, pretty large, David. Uh, I had a great time, so we, I, did, I led two trips. One is the annual Lewis and Clark trip, uh, a couple of days canoeing on the White Cliffs section of the Missouri east of Fort Benton and then days up in the Bitterroot Mountains along the Nez Perce Trail. Um, and the second trip was one I haven't done for a couple of decades, which was a float trip, a raft trip on the Salmon River in Idaho. The Salmon River is an amazing stream. It has one of the deepest gorges in North America. Uh, it's a river that has been left alone uh, by industrialization. It's in the Frank Church wilderness. Frank Church was a, an important U.S. senator from Idaho in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and that was one of the most pleasurable things I think that I've ever done. Uh, we had two great groups. 
Uh, the trips were, were back-to-back, but quite different. Um, you know, our, our camp hosts in both instances were Russ and, and Liz Eagle of North Carolina, and they could not be better at what they do. And I think everyone had a really spectacular time. So we're doing them again next year, not the salmon trip, but the, the two Lewis and Clark trips so people can sign up. Well, wait, I have to stop you there because that's news. This is uh, the first time you've actually done two of them. And there's already been numerous inquiries from people about next year and future years. They're filling so fast now. This trip is the is the great trip that I get to lead. I lead trips to France and trips to Cuba and trips to Steinbeck's California and trips to Jefferson's Virginia. And soon there will be a trip to Greece and another trip to France in, in the fall of, of 2022. But, but here's the thing that I really need to say, David. First well, of course, well, I always say that they all ask about you and wonder if you really exist. And I try to persuade them that you do. Uh, but there is some skepticism. That, and, and everyone says, come on, get him out here. And I say, you try it. You, you, here's his telephone number. You call him. He's a homebody. <laughs> He's home tending his tomatoes. But there is widespread praise and curiosity about you uh, out on the Lewis and Clark Trail. But, but the more important thing that I need to say is that is, you know, we started the program by talking about drought. The drought that we're in here on the Great Plains is extreme. Uh, people need only Google the, the drought maps to see that. Nobody is quite sure whether this is an El Nino effect and, and such things happen from time to time or whether it's one of the periodic drought periods that happened to the Great Plains, or whether this is the new normal uh, in a world of global climate change. And I, I, I met a number of people who are serious climate scientists while I was in Montana and Idaho. And, of course, my old friend Wayne Fairchild, the uh, president of Lewis and Clark Trail Adventures, whose livelihood depends upon this area for recreation, and they're concerned, David, that this, this doesn't look good. And, and we, for the first time, we could not go up on the low, low trail to the exact campsites of Lewis and Clark because the Forest Service had closed the trails because of the fires that have sprung up out there. Um, they may have slightly overreacted, but of course, an abundance of caution is a really important thing. So we had to stay down closer to the Locksaw River. It was very hot. Fortunately, the river's are uh, extremely refreshing. There was smoke in the air, although it didn't bother our joy, but we certainly were aware of it. And when we were on the salmon, we actually floated by fires, small ones, along the shore, some of which had been lit by the Forest Service as backfires to keep the larger fires from coming down to some of those campgrounds. But this is a really difficult time. And as you said earlier, the farmers of the Great Plains, eastern Montana, the Dakotas, are suffering. Fortunately, we have a safety net in the U.S. Farm Program, and I'm, I'm guessing that governors will call upon the president of the United States to declare disaster areas for, in some of these counties. I guess my point is that it's not clear what's going to happen here. I'm hoping, you know, people ask me every day, do you think the American people will wake up to the truth about global climate change? Do you think the American people will, will start to demand that our legislative bodies, state, local, and national, uh, attend to this and, and, and really address this question. And I, I repeat, David, that it, it's at least possible that this is simply a, a one-off or a periodic drought on the plains. The plains are subject to drought. John Wesley Powell told us that beyond 100th meridian, you can expect drought pretty often. And so I want to be a little cautious about this, but if this is the future, this is going to have a revolutionary disruption on the Great Plains. As you say, I know people that are tremendous, efficient farmers and ranchers who are terrified about where they're going to get hay to get through the winter. You know, hay is hardly available at, at any cost these days. And people are plowing up their wheat or baling it for straw. And, and they're saying all the same thing to me, and I'm sure you're hearing it too. We can probably get through this year but if this, is, if this continues through next year, it will be an economic and social disaster because there's no accumulated moisture. And, and anyone who knows farming knows that you have to accumulate some moisture in the late summer and fall and winter so that you have a little bit of a, of a subsurface abundance or at least sufficiency 
when you plant in the spring of 2022, and people are really worried about this. So this did not hurt the trips. The trips were fantastic, but we all felt a little bit closer to this set of issues and a concern, of course, for the people who are likely to suffer economically or otherwise, but also concern about whether the United States, this is, I guess, the biggest question I can ask, is the United States capable at this point in its paralytic history of addressing a question of this magnitude? This may be one of the great challenges that the United States and the, and the world have ever had to face. And the question is, are we equipped as a people to address this question? The, the whole purpose of the Jefferson Hour is to ground ourselves in the vision of the founding fathers. And they certainly believed that we were capable of doing this. And I think for a long time we were. But at the moment, it just feels as if we, we can't get serious or we can't find the vocabulary or we can't find the, the wherewithal to engage in this conversation in a scientifically based, meaningful, rational um, not desperate, but concerned manner. And I just don't see that debate occurring in the halls of Congress or in the state legislatures either. But that debate is surely coming if this continues. It's a grim subject. Uh, may I switch to do a bit of housekeeping and uh, inform people the actual dates for next year's Lewis and Clark tours, uh, which will be the first one July 17th through July 26th, the 2nd, July 31st through August 9th. If people are interested, they can go to the website, jeffersonhour.com, to find out more specific information. And you can also support the show there, and we appreciate that so very much. You've got an online course on Virgil that starts Saturday, August 28th. Yes, so Virgil, I was just saying to the very interesting and delightful Demi of Colorado. I hope she'll stay in touch with us. I'd love to send her my new book, but also to encourage her in any way that I can or, uh, and to serve in, in some simple way as a mentor if she really is serious about this. But uh, what a wonderful what a wonderful letter from an extraordinary young woman. But you know the, the, I said to her that you must you know must read Virgil, must read the Aeneid in front of me right here at my table in the New Enlightenment Radio Network kitchen um, are four um, translations of the Aeneid. Um, Robert Fagels is one of them. Uh, that's a really extraordinary, uh, sort of recently classical translation of the Aeneid, but I have others. One can't go wrong uh, by reading this. And so uh, Homer is the Iliad and the Odyssey. Virgil comes much later and produced the Aeneid, which is sort of a kind of a composite of both plots from the Iliad and the Odyssey, but tuned to the world of Rome. Uh, it's one of the most important books of the of Western civilization from about the time of, say, 200 AD until 1800. It was maybe the most read book in Western civilization, except for the Bible. It was that important. Now it's largely forgotten. Uh, it's not as accessible um, as, say, Homer, which uh, reads like a novel, but it's brilliant and it, it's, its influence has been incalculable. It's one of my favorite books and so I'm teaching this course and there's still room if people want to, to join us in that, but it'll be a couple of sessions. Um, pr the price is right, no quizzes, uh, no final exams, and we will together read uh, one of the three or four foundation books of Western civilization. Back to the Lewis and Clark Trail questions. I got a couple that I'm just going to include, and one was from Terry Blythe, who says, a friend and I are interested in the 2022 Lewis and Clark Trail Tour. What are the dates, and how do we sign up? And again, they'll all be at jeffersonhour.com. You can find out. And then there was another one from Jason Smith. I'm anxious to hear your reaction on this one, sir. We are planning a Lewis and Clark Trio in about five to seven years. If Clay does not continue with it, I hope he can train someone else. I have a group of four that just can't wait to go, but we need to retire first. Well, I will. I, I, I hope that I will continue to be able to, to lead these tours. I was asked on the trip a couple of times, how long do you want to continue doing this? And I said, till I'm in my late 80s, if possible. 
So yes, um, I'm planning to do it for at least the next 15 years if my body will hold out. Here's what I do, David. Every year I go out there and it's sort of like a same time next year look in the mirror because it's the same hike, it's the same canoeing, it's the same um, adventure, same strenuosity. And every year I think, okay, how, how, how well am I doing? And every year I come back wanting to wear a hair shirt and whip myself because I think, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to perk things up a little on the physical side if I want to do this as many more years. Wait as a minute, I do. a hair shirt and whip yourself? That's right. That's you know, like medieval flagellation. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I was ashamed of myself because I, what happened, and not to get into great detail, but I was getting out of one of the canoes, um, and the canoe drifted off and it stretched my leg and it oh. tore my hamstring and oh. it was just like just exceedingly painful and then so now i have this hamstring injury and yet i can't be limping around because i'm, I'm you know i'm pretending to be captain meriwether lewis of the us corps <laughs> of discovery and so it's like shooting pains and so but that what that taught me was that should not have happened that injury came because I was not as, uh, my legs were not as strong as they needed to be. And and so if, if, if five years ago, that would have been um, a, a minor thing. Not, it didn't stop me from doing anything that I wanted to do on this trip, but it told me, get serious, Buster. You know, you've got to take care of yourself if you want to do these trips. And so uh, that's a good thing. And I've since I got back, I've been... Um, rigorously working out every day. Uh, I, I'm, as you probably know, I'm about to climb Mount Whitney, um, the highest point in the lower 48 states. And so one of two things is true. Either I will climb it and whine desperately when I get back, or you will never hear from me again. We just have a few moments left. I want to get a couple of book questions to you. One comes from Dan Feehan. And he just acquired the six-part biography of Jefferson by Dumas Malone and wanted to know what your thoughts on, on that book are. You can't go wrong reading Dumas Malone. You simply can't go wrong. It's six volumes. He's a great writer. He's, it's definitive, you know, his facts. It's brilliantly researched, uh, wonderfully annotated, grounded in evidence. Uh, it's 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 the best major biography ever written about Thomas Jefferson, and you simply can't go wrong. But like the Hubble, when it went up and, and, and didn't focus quite right, it helps today to wear a kind of corrective lens as you read it. And I mean no disrespect to the great Malone. I met him in the last years of his life, and I revered him then and still. I'm not one of his critics, but he is so positive about Mr. Jefferson so apologetic when Jefferson is doing something that's not really admirable that it feels a little bit like what's known as hagiography, you know, the saint's life. We now know that Jefferson was imperfect. He knew that too, but he thought that his perfections were so much greater than his imperfections that it wasn't useful for him to spend much time on the imperfections. Today, as you know, the reverse is the case in historiography and everyone is fixated on Jefferson's imperfections and ignoring uh, his greatest achievements. And so uh, you can't go wrong in reading this book, but just remember that Jefferson has some fundamental issues and race is certainly central uh, to the problem of Jefferson, but gender is a question, the displacement of Native Americans is a question, his, his sometimes Machiavellian political activities behind the scenes that you know, Jefferson was was one of the greatest men in American history. He was, in many respects, America's Da Vinci. But he also, at times, was a routine power politician who knew exactly how to get things done. And the, the tragedy of Jefferson, as as you know, David, is that he was born into a world of slavery. He wrestled with it and agonized over it and maneuvered in different ways and tried to figure out a path out for himself and for Virginia and for the country. He was never successful. He eventually became somewhat complacent about this question. He's clearly, in my opinion, a racist, no matter how you define that term, and an apartheidist. And he's responsible in some ways for perpetuating um, the race uh, issue outside of his own generation. You know, his, he kept looking for the moment when we would somehow magically 
uh, escape from the world of slavery. But it doesn't happen by magic. It takes overt action by individuals and by uh, bodies of, of legislatures. And Jefferson just couldn't see a way. And so you have to keep all that in mind as a kind of the permanent asterisk. And this is my view, that there now must be uh, an indelible permanent asterisk around Jefferson's achievement that says, yes, but he dispossessed native peoples uh, because he looked at the continent as a tabula rasa. And yes, uh, he was a slaveholder who in the end became quite complacent about the continuation of that execrable practice, as he called it, in the Declaration of Independence. And so if you keep those asterisks in mind, you can't go wrong in reading Dumas Malone. Very good, sir, and that is where we shall have to end our conversation for this week. I've enjoyed it so much. Very pleasant discussion with President Jefferson and with you. I welcome you back. And again, if people are interested in any of the things we've talked about, go to jeffersonhour.com to find out more. And with that, sir, good day. And to anyone who's interested in the classical tradition, read Tom Holland's two books, eminently readable, Rubicon and Dynasty. Tom Holland. Rubicon and Dynasty. Beyond that, we'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.